probably responsible for me to actually able to my application to graduate school. So I'm a political scientist because of this. Right? Uh, he has had many academic appointments. Uh, he did his uh, doctoral work up at Wisconsin. Uh, he was the provost uh, up at the University of Missouri. Uh, he's currently uh, the department chair of political science at Mississippi State University. Uh, KC, I think he did the doctoral work and the dissertation on John right. And so I asked him to come over because Dr. Rudley uh, has met both of these gentlemen and he's very interested in expanding our study abroad program to the university. All right. And Dr. Rudley, uh, you saw some of the announcements. Uh, he accomplished uh, how many students are there? About 10 students, I think, uh, on the last trip to. Salvador and also Sao Paulo. Uh, and we had the opportunity to talk about memorandum of understanding. So the president of the university is very interested in trying to pull all academic programs. And he even wants to expand the study abroad to include staff because he feels that there's certainly some benefit on both sides in terms of uh, Texas Southern University and also Salvador Bahia. If you know anything about Brazil, you know you find the largest concentrations of Africans outside of the continent of Africa, the continent of Africa. And you'll find most of those in Salvador. And so we have sort of like a kindred spirit. We want to have uh, not so much of a, of a lecture, but the kind of exchange where you can ask questions about the recently benefits of Brazil. And also, uh, we've heard a lot in terms of the international affair. In terms of, we hear a lot about the NSA, we the Snowden affair. We don't often hear a lot about uh, what's going on in Africa, unless it's something bad or in Brazil. So today, this is an opportunity for the university to have a genuine exchange and to hear from uh, two of the foremost experts in the field in terms of African policy and also Brazilian policy. And I'm going to segue now. I, I think Sabira, I think, would be fitting because she has been the person who has organized the study abroad just to talk about. If you're interested in expanding your academic programs, your groups, in terms of what opportunities are there, because Dr. Morrison, he introduced us to both uh, the individuals in Brazil, right, and the Brazilian group was a part of an academic experience we had through the National Conference of Black Political Science, all right, and that was an effort to to look at what was going on in terms of Afro-Brazilian politics, and so out of that group. Dr. Morrison was one of the leaders through the American Political Science Association, also the National Conference of Black Political Science. And then he's had an on-standing, uh, ongoing relationship, uh, if you will, uh, with the AYA Center, where Dr. Morrison was provost, as I mentioned earlier, of the University of Missouri. <coughs> and every year they do a December study abroad. So he actually initiated that, <coughs> taking students to Ghana. And we were able to take a cohort of students to Ghana as well. Again, as I said, I owe a lot to this kind of So, Zabir, why don't you talk about the study of the and how plan some of those, and then we'll go into the lecture. Well, what's unique about the executive master's and the administration program is the fact that our study abroad is included as part of the tuition. So, that does uh, create less of a barrier for many students because, of course, that is, you know, they have the option to participate or not participate. One of the things we ended up doing is actually incorporating the study abroad program into the topical seminar course to ensure that we were, uh, that there were some measures, that this was not just a, a, a trip for students to go on, you know, you go to a couple of lectures, but there's, no there's not necessarily any forms of academic accountability. And so what we did was we incorporated that into the topical seminar course. As I said, for uh, we study abroad, it is optional because our students are, uh, um, you know, usually full time, working full time. They cannot travel for extended periods. Um, so we go from between 10 to 14 days. And uh, so what I'm saying in that particular instance is that students have the option to participate. And if they cannot participate, they are placed in an alternative uh, section of topical seminar in that, in the case that they cannot participate in the study abroad program. Um, the program itself is very intense, as uh, Dr. Adams has mentioned. The president came on uh, the last one to Brazil, and he 
he actually said to us, this is too much. The students need, <laughs> the students need a break. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, I think, you know, as, as we move forward, it's a learning process to know, to find that balance. But at the same time, there, you know, there really is such a rich and um, important opportunity for students to learn, whether that's culturally, uh, academically, and also for a lot of the public servants that we, you know, we've met uh, throughout this process. Um, what's been unique for us is that uh, our, on our second uh, study abroad program to Brazil, there was a massive police strike. And then when we went the last time, there were social and civil unrest. So I, I think we're both, we're lucky and unlucky. We're lucky because it, it definitely helps to uh, uh, improve and, and really create a, a very unique opportunities for students to learn in an intense environment, which has been great for us. And also, as a, a historically black college, being able to connect with other diaspora, uh, both in Ghana and in Brazil, has been tremendous for our students. And uh, one thing is uh, African Americans, there was a study that was done, and African Americans are some of the least likely to participate in study abroad programs. And though there are no formal studies as of yet, uh, there have been some reports that have emerged that talk about uh, those who participate in study abroad, earning more, uh, you know, finishing college at a, a faster rate uh, than those who do not participate in study abroad. So there are several, uh, uh, um, there are several great um, um, things that our students can take advantage of by participating in study abroad programs. Um, of course, in the planning process, what we've done with uh, both in the case of going to Ghana and um, taking groups to Brazil, uh, I co-coordinate co with the on-ground coordinator indicating what the objectives are um, of the course, of the topical seminar course for that particular year, and then the lectures are scheduled accordingly. Lengthwise, again, we're considering and taking into consideration what our students are, you undergraduate students, while a longer study abroad may be appropriate. For us, that's not the case. Uh, so those are some of the elements that go into studying, uh, or going into planning the study abroad. But like I said, one of the, I think one of the, the things that is most important is that we are uh, increasing the number of students who are engaging with the diaspora, and also who are really just going beyond their own borders. And hopefully, that this as historical black college stand is an important pillar in African American and Black communities that that's something that they will also extend and, and to their families, that there's something greater that's happening for our students in this process. So um, I guess I'll, at this point, I'll invite Dr. Morrison and Dr. Koga. So either one of you can go first, however you feel. You said young man? OK, well, go ahead. I can, I can go do this one. I can change this. Good evening. Good afternoon to everyone. And it's a pleasure for me to come here, and uh, especially because it was a very, very nice invitation opportunity to meet uh, Michael here and Sylvia because we've been working together over the last three years. And uh, my perspective, I all, I all the time we see with them in Brazil, finally can come here to see their house, their place, their home. And so it's good for me to. In some cases, especially <coughs> every time to represent the Texas of the University in Brazil, talk about the, the university introduced to my party there in Brazil. Because in, every time we need to invite people to give a lecture and to ask them to allow us to visit some uh, uh, cooperation, public administration office in so many places, and the civil rights activists and so many people, I need to know. Uh, exactly where the people come from, like for example, people from the West, and so I can uh, uh, stress the idea the importance of keep this track of uh, uh, interaction for them. And the second stop is to meet my friend, Professor uh, Casey Morris, because we've seen together uh, only four years ago. Yeah, we were. were uh, we have an expectation to go to a media conference in Spain, so this stuff was canceled, so I could go finally can meet him again. That were a very nice moment. I'm going to try to use some information uh, about my lecture to a group of students from Howard University. Don't uh, give a uh, 
kind of like, I see a very hard to downplay the importance of the year. I'm just show that the, the information that I like to share because the people were there uh, uh, 23 and uh, it was still the moment of uh, uh, concern and uh, uh, evaluation of the impact of the mass protest in Brazil and so I collect a few information it's something amazing about what's going on in Brazil because uh, it has given for us the idea about the dynamic of the political environment in Brazil. And the, in this sense, I'd, I'd like to stress the idea if you are uh, concerned about doing some research about Brazil, but in American country, it's a very nice subject. In the, but if you are concerned very much about the issues in American society, I think the experience of Brazilian um, movement now and the the protest there also can give some tips about how to this dynamic here in the US. For example, the role of the youth people there in the street protesting and the agenda they brought to the, the public arena also can make us think twice about what the government should do to avoid this kind of trouble. It's why I think uh, this kind of action program has to be adopted. It's very nice because when we go to abroad, you think very clear about the issue, the, the domestic affair you have. That's why I think it's very nice to take into consideration going to this and all the country. I'd like it first uh, to show you. I have a list of information on my agenda. What I'd like to show is so big, but I'd like <laughs> to stress just a few points. Uh, let's go to see the map of Brazil. Just go to the go to the website. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to go. In case I cannot finish the whole of the lecture, at least you're going to see where is Brazil is and the, how it's look like. <laughs> <laughs> It's very nice. Uh, it's a uh, you know, go to uh, uh, yeah, go there. No, 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 So, my idea was uh, to show you the picture of Brazil and compare it to the US. In the map, you can see the Brazilians in Latin America, and it's one of the five biggest countries in the world, like behind the whole of uh, Russia, China, Australia, the US, and also Canada. So, it's among the big. The economy is also. Is very powerful, it's among the 10 biggest uh, economy in the world. And the, here you can see English. It's nice to see the map of life because the uh, map gives you the right notion about uh, 
Give you the idea about the the distance here and how how long you're gonna travel to arrive there. For example, I spend the, almost one day to, <laughs> to come here and uh, the map of Brazil. The map of Brazil. Yeah. So here, you can like show. So this is the map of Brazil, you can see here, Brazil, and uh, as I told you, Russia, uh, China, so many big countries, US here, and here Brazil, and uh, I don't need to give information about the US, you know, the, like, how huge the uh, American economy, like uh, uh, 14 trillion uh, billion dollars uh, 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 gross domestic product, so Brazil is only uh, about three, three, three trillion billion, uh, billion, three trillion billion dollars domestic uh, product. So it's uh, compared to the US, it's not big, but at least uh, it's uh, a very interesting country to hear Brazil, the data, how big, it, about two million, uh, two hundred million people there, um, the majority population. Uh, there is a huge uh, debate about uh, the proportion of white and black in Brazil, but at least we can see today it's half half. When we consider, uh, because if there was a decline of the, the number of people who would be glad to be black, to be white. There was a huge <coughs> people who would start to present themselves as black recently. Because we have public policy, uh, like affirmative action, also we had uh, recently uh, we hear the debate uh, the, over the last 20 years, the black movements they start to be very active, like uh, trying to develop self consciousness and uh, bringing issues of affirmative uh, action, especially also about uh, uh, self identification as a black. So it changed the profile of the, 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 the society, even in the sense of the result of the statistics bureau. That's the, uh, if, I, if I were to, if I were you, I would take notes about this that Statistics Bureau, because the Brazilian Statistics Bureau, they give general information about Brazil. And if they want to know about Brazil, it's very cool, reliable. You can go there. And so you can come here. And I think, let me see. You can see the population here. You can see how many people. Uh, I think rate of birth you can see here, uh, but I think the best point here is to talk about the uh, major issue. Because I could talk about the uh, um, environment, uh, um, uh, social economic issues, inequality. The, it's a, a kind of statistic to make me sad. In the very end, whenever you think about the worst information about Brazil, it has to do with the black population. You go point by point every time, like uh, children mortality, mortality, homicide, um, every information, the kind of unemployment rates, uh, it's worse for the black population. But in the very end, over the last 20 years, we increased very much the quality of life in Brazil. Because we have two uh, governments. Since 1994, we have a, a change in the, the, the government. We have a, a economic stabilization. Uh, after, as we said, uh, uh, economic reform, finally, uh, the government in 1994 could uh, uh, organize the economy and give a new uh, hope for the population. So we have a, a very quality, uh, according to the new data, uh, the rates of employment is, uh, employment is very nice. It's, uh, we don't have a, uh, like a, this spread of unemployment so far. The economy is very powerful. <laughs> And also uh, the, the the way uh, the government uh, protect uh, social uh, organized the welfare states now is much better. We have some uh, grants to protect for people. And for example, over the last 20, uh, 10 years, uh, the government just provides uh, pro uh, social protection for over fifty million people there, like they were uh, brought from. Uh, like very poor people, 
to have uh, something like uh, which we can avoid them to start. So it's a major transformation. There is uh, may, many research about that. And then you can see here kind of the aspect of the transformation in Brazil, because poor people were allowed to have access to new uh, uh, consumer products. For example, telephone, uh, cell block tel uh, telephone, also furniture, car, so many stuff. And you can see here that uh, today we have uh, out amount about more cell block phone than people there. It's a huge connection. It's because the, there was a, the, the movement of the government to uh, the telephone system became private. So they increased the, 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 the share to everyone. And now we have a huge change, uh, trend and change in the society. But the point like you can see the number of telephone numbers, the, the change in the consumer style. And because it increases so much the quality of life, according to the standard before, there was something that happened, it was amazing. The expectation of the population just increased too. Usually, when people think about Christ, we think about it. They are starving to death, so they uh, don't have, uh, uh, they start to go to the, the street, they charge the politician. In the Brazilian case, was the, the opposite. There was, uh, they, they uh, increased the level of expectation, so people start to have access to new commodities, and then, because of uh, some event of the oil cup, and the expectation of to have more improvements, then we have a huge problem, a mass protest in the street. That's one uh, very important aspect. Let me show you. Yes. I was thinking about showing some information about statistics about violence in Brazil. And the, uh, I gave up because uh, it's sad the statistics. Gender statistics and the racial statistics like almost side in Brazil. The number of almost side, almost side of this, uh, based on race. If you see the, the, the rates of the death among the white and black in Brazil, it's just amazing. It's, it seems as if uh, by the time a guy reached the age of uh, 15 years old to 30 years old, he's a very, uh, he has a huge possibility of being killed in Brazil. The, the rate is like 6% more for blacks than for whites. So it's a kind of statistic I don't want to share. I, gonna, I just want to present, give some direction so maybe you can do your, your research. And the statistics about women violence too is very high. So security is an issue in Brazil. And also public transportation. Here I bought uh, uh, <coughs> the latest statistics or information of freedom pools about the profile of people which went to the streets. What is the point in uh, a brief account about the death rate? Until 19, or until May, we didn't have any uh, situation of uh, mass protest. People were, didn't concern about the, the, the country in that, in this, that sense. I went to a conference to talk about the election in Brazil, and uh, among the well, most uh, the leading uh, scholar uh, which started the election in Brazil, then we didn't come up with the idea about what the future would be like. We couldn't uh, foresee the, over, the outcome of the election. We knew that the, the today uh, president of Brazil, President Dilma, could be reelected, but it was a, her popularity was so high. And then, in exactly in, May, in June, we start to have mass protests in Brazil. And the point is something very amazing. Nobody knew about that. You saw in the TV, in the newspapers, and the. Uh, the way people went to the street, like 100,000 people there. And then uh, the, the question that every scholar, the politician, the government started to place was, why they put those black people once, and what, what, how, how they look like, what the profile of the people. 
that research was released in Nisantu, so you can see it was a uh, SAPU organized by a uh, very important academic group in Brazil. And you can see here, go down, the profile of the student here. You can see uh, the question, uh, who went to the street? The first question here. You can see the profile. Half a half women, you can see uh, the person participates of women and, and, uh, and men, equal for proportion. And also, some of them uh, should have the right going to the street, uh, have a, that experience of, of public participation. And you can see a lot of students and also people which work. Some of them work for the first time. That's amazing. We need to understand that situation about Brazil. Come up with some, uh, remember about the Brazil experience. Brazil has a, a huge tradition of uh, authoritarian regime. At least three times in, in that history, we live under a uh, military regime. Until 19, from 1964 to 1985, we have a military regime. So finally, we come back to democracy. We have a uh, direct election to elect to go, uh, president there in, in 1989. Then we could stabilize the, the system, the political system. You can see that some way those students which went to the streets, sometimes they don't have any idea about this kind of uh, political uh, uh, conflict that we needed before. Then finally, you can see the age of those students, and those people. You can see the majority here. You can see 43% from 14 to 24 years old. So young people went to the streets. Why, how they mobilized to go there? Using the internet. Facebook was a tool to mobilize those people. Then you can see the, the like college student, uh, undergraduate student, and finally you can see the profile, the income profile of them. Go there, so you can see the income profile. I cannot compare to the US because uh, income in the US in Brazil is very different. Like when you make it about uh, 10, 10 uh, minimum salary there, you are supposed to be rich. But usually, uh, you can see that people, uh, they have some income, they are not employed. And usually people say that, uh, according to Brazil standard, they could be like a middle class. A student, college, college educate, middle class, which were organized by the internet. The motivation of them to go there, usually like friendship, not so much like a political awareness about the, the, the situation. And you have several, uh, the agenda, they go there to protest against, uh, against uh, the increase of the public, the bus fare, yeah, bus fare. And the, so also the, per the subway or the bus fare? Bus fare, bus fare. Bus fare. Yeah. And that was because- That was supposed to be the one mayor. Yes, yes, yes. If you remember the US, one of the reasons of the protest, the civil rights protest in the US was bus fare too. Yeah. You know, so go there. So yeah. You can see, uh, just a second. What is the agenda of them? Some of them, the majority of them protest against healthcare. They want better healthcare system, secure, safe. Then come education. Drugs, drugs in the sense, we don't know exactly what they mean by drugs. If they want to have the right to use drugs or to 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 combat, to fight against drugs, fight against drugs, corruption, and then they lie the coast. You can see the situation. Go. You can see the agenda is very general. Uh, general. We went. We have a meeting with the. The police, uh, police commander then in Salvador, in Bahia, during the event of protest. Uh, a group of students went there to talk to them. And one of the explanations of the police there was they didn't know how to negotiate with them because they don't, didn't know what they want. Hmm. Their agenda was so broad that they couldn't uh, come up with any solution. Then come the, the, what, the kind of, uh, the level of interest they have in politics. So 61% said they have like a huge interest in politics. Then come here, like 28% uh, they 
middle of it, hinder them, just a few said they don't care about politics. But on the other hand, if you see how they treat the relationship with the, politi po the political, uh, poli professional politician, they just don't care about them. They reject it. They reject political institution. They don't like bodies. They avoid to have a bodies join the, the protest there. And also, you can see, just say, uh, the people with support the manifestation. 75% said they want to have people in the streets. That's amazing because um, by the time the mass protest, even my, my daughter went to the protest, I was concerned because she's 18 years old. She was like in Sao Paulo. She lives in Sao Paulo. It's a city uh, far away from my, 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 my state. And then she's a college student, a law student. She just went with for her colleagues because she just wants to join the group and enjoy the situation. <laughs> and they also protest against the corruption. And then come here, you can see there are only 22% are against the mobilization. Then comes uh, um, again, let's go there. The, the reason of the protest, like public industry, uh, uh, transportation, uh, corruption, and then probably more investment in the in the education. Let's go here. Uh, go ahead. Facebook. You can see how they they go to they, they knew about the the protest. Facebook. You can see six two percent use the Facebook. I think the guy, the owner of the Facebook, is proud of the situation. Then you can see, and finally. The political action, what they want there. They want to, the, the reaction of the police against the, 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 the protesters. They use violence. The police also they negotiate some time. The point is, when you have a, a mass protest like this, um, not all people with good faith go there. You can see everyone there, like teeth, People would, would uh, want to get, uh, give trouble to the government. So it's, it was a mess sometimes. But if you, if you go there, you could see just a few situations where you have a, a violence, a trouble, violence, violence and trouble. Usually, like people on the streets, they protest, they like hang around, dating. So many stuff going on. Even when you have like a major picture as people going to the street protesting. And go here. Yeah, so the final end, I'd like to finish my presentation. The final end is uh, what's the outcome of that situation? You can see it here. The hope of the people just decreased. Because over the last 10 years, Brazil uh, lived the experience of pride, hope, and the expectation that the life would become better. Because we have a seven, Increasing the salary, we have employment, very good employment rates. Also, we have uh, the, the the government support to the poor people. Also, we have this uh, so many uh, international events happening in Brazil, like World Cup, uh, Olympic Games is going to happen there. We said we have a very uh, Catholic meeting there, youth Catholic meeting, like about uh, three million, four million people went there to Brazil to celebrate their faith. So, and if we compare that situation to uh, the outcome of the, the meeting, we could see that in some way, uh, by the time people still were in the streets, like to express their grievance against the state, we just realized the government started to think twice about what they could do to overcome that situation. And don't let, never think, let, never. Uh, uh, Keep in mind that we are in a moment before the election. Before the election, every kind of issues can become a major issues. And that moment, the idea of a challenging government is good for the opposition. And that moment, you can see, like uh, some of people, like 55%, believe that the mass protest is going to improve the situation in Brazil. And the other hand, some of them consider the mass protest, 
they consider they another situation to protest. They, they, they didn't need to go to the street, they could use another tools like uh, uh, apply to their uh, governments, try to really, uh, to ask them, talk directly to their politicians, to use uh, another uh, tools. And some of them, like 4%, they don't care very much. That's the points, hot lists and fast lists. The very end you see, like here, uh, some people believe that at the end, the protests won't change so much the situation you see. You can see. And some of them believe we're going to improve a little bit. Go ahead. That's finished. I'd like to show just the results of the, the graph. That's the result of the mass protests. Yeah, I, I, I'm a political scientist, you know, it's, it's a it's habit, we need to know where the protests are going to take us. In that situation, uh, the streets wake, the students went to the, to the streets, they protest, they express their, their uh, perception about the political economy and also about corruption in political institution. They say they don't trust uh, parties. They say they prefer to have a political reform. And also, at the very end, when you see the result of that pool, you see that the opinion about the, the popularity of the president just went down. From, you can see here, before the events, it's May, March, <coughs> March where can you see here? You can see uh, the the perception of the popularity of the president was very nice. At least it was a middle point. <coughs> if you can see, like, some people see the first, almost half of the people consider good, and are uh, very good. Then you can see 44% consider regular, and just only 7% perceive the situation as very bad. Let's see the line when you come here. In June, we just increased it from 7 to 25% people, which has a huge criticism against the, the government. The point, it's, uh, the, the perception of that the situation was bad, it's very understandable, but the, the worst uh, sign for the government was to see the decrease of the, the, the evaluation of the government. It, that, that went from 65% here, to 30%. You can see here, the decline, it's a major change, you know. So <coughs> what should be done when the government face a, a report like this, which says, it's about time for you to change your policy, public policy. So they did. They just present an appeal to the, to the Congress to make a major political reform. They just freeze the, the tax there. And now they are also uh, trying to promote some public policy just for favor of uh, youth people and college students. So you have some situation about Brazil. That's uh, the kind of policy I'd like to share with you and to give opportunity for my partner, Casey Morrison, to present her uh, information about the agenda. And so hopefully, at the end of the day, that talk, that meeting, we can talk again about uh, Brazil and Ghana, compare. If you have any questions, just ask me. I would be pleased to give information. I'd like to know, you showed the distribution of population of, uh, I presume the population distribution that you showed is all urban population? Or? No, it's, it's all the like, population. Yeah. All the population? Yeah. So it's opinion pool, opinion pool among the 80 biggest cities in Brazil. Okay, but it's all in urban then? Yes. Okay, so the question I would like to ask, is there no concern? I know they were the ones who were involved with the protest. Yes. Then what happens to the people who live, particularly in Manaus and some of the Amazon area, where you have a lot of indigenous populations, yes. all these uh, people who actually live in the jungle? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because 
usually the, the mass protests start in the big city of Sao Paulo. Then it starts a wave of uh, protests every major Brazil, a Brazilian city. Sao Paulo, Salvador, the capital, like major capital, city which has about, about more than uh, 3 million people. Then suddenly it starts to spread all over the country. Even middle sized cities start to have protests. I don't know exactly for me about uh, Manaus, but I know that every place will have protests. And the agenda was just common basic. Bus transportation, healthcare, more opportunity for youth, especially if you care about health. I don't know if I answer your question. Well, two, two questions. The first one, as I looked at your timeline, it seemed that June 2013, what happened? That was a precipitous drop in support of the government. Yeah, June 14th. Uh, the point is, uh, Subria and Michael went there. It was the beginning of Apple Talk. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Uh, uh, Michael. 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 <laughs> the cause of protest was Michael. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, uh, that's a good question because at this specific moment, we had the beginning of the uh, World Cup. Conferential World Cup. So it's uh, like a rehearsal that the uh, International Football Association organized to prepare for the next year uh, World Cup. And that, no more qualifying, it's just it's a, a championship. They, like the champion of every uh, cont continental, go there to play against each other. And so it's a kind of rehearsal, I believe, in this sense. So by the time they, 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 that events started, uh, the, the, the students went to the street to protest because the, the, that federation, the National Federation Football Association, they just uh, asked for the Brazilian government so many uh, responsibilities. For example, there was increasing the, the expense, uh, the government expense to afford to build so many stadiums in Brazil. And also to give uh, to release the tax for the, the some uh, international company. So in that situation, what happened? We could see, like the Brazilian public could see, one on one on side, the Brazilian government just released and give a lot of money for private sector. In the other hand, the people still need some uh, to have. A, uh, provision of so many uh, services like uh, healthcare, bus transportation, hospital, so many stuff. So that's uh, 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 like you have a middle, a, a picture where people can have a clear situation about the kind of commitment that the government has to provide uh, to organize the society. Very good. That's the process. And the second question is well, what's the status of teachers in Brazil? What's the status? Are they revered? Unlike in America, I think teacher they don't have good luck any place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. I, I don't know. I don't think many good things in Europe. Yeah, of course. Uh, Sweden, that is true. Sweden, it's kind of every country. It's true. Japan, at least, but as far as I know, it's like the Brazilian case. Like if you are uh, like college uh, professor like me, you have better status. You have an uh, opportunity to, to make so many jobs, and you, it's much better. <coughs> and by, uh, like undergraduate or oh, high school teacher, depending on if it's a private sector or public sector, and uh, usually they they don't do uh, as good as like a, a lawyer, engineer, those people, but they can survive. But usually they they concern about the, their responsibilities. Because usually uh, the, the, the society understands the teacher as a, a priest, religious uh, vocation. And so they expect too much. And we have to be uh, like urban problem, like uh, city crime uh, that has to do with the uh, school. And so the teacher usually they have a, like a very dangerous environment in the sense that they deal with so many trouble that the society has. So that goes to the street, to the, the, the school, they need to manage there. I think they deserve better salary. But in the very end, I think over the last 
10 years, I think it has some improvement. It's not so good, but it's much better. I have on this approach. I think uh, before I, I know about the Brazilian experience before that moment. I'm not left wing uh, orientation in that sense, but I know that we have a, a, some, uh, some uh, improvements in the sense that before uh, we didn't have, uh, we have an economic crisis. Also, we have a, a like a neoliberal agenda. You know what I mean? Neoliberal. Like, uh, just cut uh, state expenditure and give it to the private sector. So that's a situation very sad. And I hopefully, I think, I hope that government keep in power, we can keep track of some improvements. <coughs> We know. People just know from the beginning of my lecture. Nobody knows about what's going to happen the, 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 the future. Because like two months before the event, we didn't have any protest, mass protest. Suddenly, people in the streets, the expectation is now government need to take care of their, their business, to show responsibility, accountability, to ask to protect by their to increase the, the, the level of uh, social fair, social fair, protect people, and also to build, to offer more than they, they, they tax us. I think that's the situation. But the point, I think we're gonna have a major economic boom because it, we're gonna have uh, some investment there because of the, the, the Olympic Games and also about the, the World Cup. And by, I don't know exactly how it's going to be the relationship of the, the people and the states in that situation. I feel like if they, they cater more to non-citizens when they host the big event, it caters more to those that are coming into the city as opposed to those that are in this Completely, city. I agree with you. Yeah. And the point is, we have a meeting uh, last, last uh, month, we have a meeting with uh, State attorney, which is planning like the, the budget, state budget to organize the games in Brazil. It's it's like a short term experience. It's a, I think that's why it's good to go to Brazil because sometimes you can go to some place where possibly couldn't have opportunity to go there in the US. So if you have a critical thinking about your own culture, by go to other places. Like for example, I don't know how many people. Uh, how many people here have opportunity to go to talk with the general attorney of uh, the US or the general attorney of the state of Texas? Then we came, we go there, went there, and she was explaining that her experience, she was a kind of upset because she could see lack of corruption, the, the kind of uh, state expenditure to afford to pay for, uh, to build a, a, a stadium like four times or three times more than would be the fair price. Do you know what I mean? Four or five times more, then that's the point. And you should also mention, one of the things that she mentioned during that meeting was they were trying to prevent her from being able to bring charges against those three be passed into legislation right. that would prevent her from bringing any charges. Mm -hmm. So it was really dynamic what she was talking about in terms of the level of corruption that was discussed. Yeah. My question. One, one last question. <laughs> My impression is, I just came back from Brazil for, I was in Rio for a week, oh, and yeah. some of the protests happened just the day I left. So the question I would raise, have you read a little bit about what's going on? It seems to me that you really have a serious public finance issue. And the taxation system seems to be very unfair that it hits the lowest income population most of all, and you have a huge income inequality. Yes. I do believe I cannot add anything more. <laughs> Can you see, please? I'm sorry. This is a topic like this. Don't mind traffic when you're here. That was actually, I was invited yeah. two times to get talk about human traffic. And yeah, but that gym is so and nice. And you know, we just <laughs> need to focus on some, some, some points. And there's just a different better? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be very brief. So, 
you'll have the opportunity to get back to the uh, Brazil discussion. I'd like to begin simply by, by posing the question of why should we care uh, about what's happening um, in Brazil or Ghana as Americans? Um, and uh, the answer to that is that there is all kinds of evidence in the circumstance that Flavis has described that are relevant to questions that we are raising in the United States about our own political experience and our own questions about who has power and who does not and how uh, resources are allocated um, in the uh, society. Um, so that really is um, the occasion or having international programs like these. It allows us the opportunity to see the extent to which we really do uh, have a resonance and a relationship with the rest of the world. That those, quote, foreigners are not as strange as we might think. Um, and that, in fact, there may well be some things we can learn about our own experience from looking at our own context. So that's how we see a lot of participate in international programs. Just a word um, about Ghana, which um, is in a place, um, it, it, it's interesting that, that Clavis began by talking um, about the map of the world and how big Brazil is compared to some other things. Well, Ghana is a part of a continent that's bigger than anything you can really imagine. Uh, Brazil can get into that continental space four or five times, and there's space left over for the United States to get in there, for Europe to get in there. Africa is a huge place. And so the possibilities um, for learning when one participates in international programs uh, in Africa is, is vast because the place is so vast and there are lots of um, uh, opportunities to learn things about variation in the world. Ghana is um, um, a country in English-speaking West Africa, we say English-speaking, because Ghana, like the United States and like Brazil, was a colony. Uh, and it was uh, colonized by uh, rich countries in Western Europe that at a point in time ran the world, or controlled the world, uh, as a product of, of taking it by, by violence and subterfuge and, and so on. So Ghana, like Brazil and the United States, um, is a, was a colony. It was colonized uh, by um, Great Britain. And that's one of the important thing, things to know about it uh, for comparative purposes. It is also um, a place that has a particular relationship to the United States because of the population of African descendants in this country, as well as Brazil. Uh, it's been noted that Brazil has the largest African population outside of Africa. Um, and Many of those uh, African descendants came from Ghana. We know this because we're able to find uh, residual aspects of, of, of language, culture, uh, social structure, um, and um, so on. Ghana was the first uh, of um, the colonies and 
Africa, south of, of the Sahara after the war to get its independence um, as a product of um, uh, the leadership of a really um, quite interesting uh, political leader that one learns about when one travels to Ghana on international programs, uh, Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah, who had, amongst other things, a vision for unifying the country uh, as a means of taking back its resources, its power, um, and so on. And um, it is a model that was so well wrought that this country of Ghana today is one of the most interesting examples of what a former colony can do in regaining its independence and maintaining unity. Now, Ghana, like lots of other countries um, in Africa, has had a turbulent post-independent history. Um, there have been coups d'etat, there has been weak, uh, there have been weak governments and so on, but one of the things that has been maintained throughout is a relatively unified government. What it looks like today, what one sees um, today if one goes on an international uh, study tour there, is a country that has made fairly great progress in average citizens finding voice for participation in public affairs. Some of what's going on in Brazil today is about average people, if you look at those numbers Klaus has put up, average people trying to find a way to obtain voice in public affairs. They see a country that's spending millions of dollars to bring an athletic program to the country at a time when they don't have health care, they don't have education, they don't have all those things, and yet there is a government that's making all of these expenditures on something that looks frivolous, actually, uh, to allow people to run up and down, uh, to race against each other, to swim against each other, and so on. If you don't have food, that's a very major question uh, about resource allocation. Well, what's happening in Ghana at this point in time, after some turbulence, is a very interesting project that allows citizens to find that voice. It began in 1992, after the country had gone through four coups d'etat, five depending on how you count it. Uh, the economy uh, was down the tubes. Uh, it was a country wealthy that was virtually bankrupt. It was wealthy because um, it, it had agricultural plenty. It was the world's greatest producer. Uh, of cocoa, and depending on how much candy you're buying out here, uh, the price of cocoa goes up and down. Uh, but Ghana had more of it at a point in time than anything else in the world. Um, Ghana had um, uh, diamonds and gold. And again, depending on how much we were pegging our economies out here uh, in this part of the world to the gold standard, Ghana's fortunes went up and down. And so in um, 1992, um, Ghana began to come to grips with the conditions of um, economic uh, depression, really. Their backs were against the wall. There was nowhere to go but up. They had hit rock bottom. And so it was the institutionalization of new governments that um, in a two-party system that looks fairly much like the party system we have in, in the United States, 
where average citizens are beginning to find the means to have voice in government. And so issues of health care and um, education, um, child care, that sort of thing, are being answered now in a manner that's fairly uh, routine in a third world country. Um, the last uh, uh, sort of thing I will say uh, about Ghana is to give you uh, an illustration and then you can ask uh, any questions you like about what's going on in Ghana and the rest of the Africa, what's going on in Ghana and the rest of Africa. I was in Ghana covering its election as a so-called expert uh, from the most democratic a country in the world, the United States, in 2000. Well, some of you may recall that the United States was also having an election in 2000. I voted in this country, and then I went off to Ghana, which was that we had our election in November. Ghana was having its election in December. I voted in November, and I went off uh, to observe the election in Ghana as a Western expert from a country that knew how to carry off elections and so we could teach more people elsewhere around the world. <laughs> By the time I got to Ghana, some of you may remember this, uh, the election in the USA still had not been resolved. Uh, there was a question of uh, a certain votes in Florida that ended up in the wrong place, um, and so we couldn't really determine who the, uh, the winner was. Ghana, on the other hand, had carried off a perfectly democratic, um, free and fair election. We all knew within a day who the winner was. Nobody's brother was uh, counting uh, the votes uh, in, in Ghana, and the brother was not paying the woman who was in charge of counting uh, the votes. So the moral of this story is that engagement in study abroad opportunities can illustrate for us how really small the world is, and that Ghanaians had a thing or two to teach Americans about how to carry off election. When they asked me how to explain what happened here, how could it happen, um, I started to explain to them what our election system is actually like how we actually carry out elections here. Elections in the United States, unlike most places elsewhere in the world, are conducted informally by partisan members of political parties. Nobody else in the world does it like that. There is a state system by which elections are organized, carried off, and votes are counted. So it's no wonder that we could have an event like this in our country where we have this kind of informal process. It's a wonder we get elections carried out in this country at all, given the way we do them. Um, it is, on the one hand, a testament to the integrity of, of the American people, um, and, and so on. But what the guy may have suggested is that the Americans needed to learn how to develop a common ballot, where the ballot in Florida would look like the ballot in Mississippi, it would look like the ballot in New York, it would look like the ballot in California. You know that they all look different now, right? When you go out to vote for the President of the United States, no one state's ballot looks like that in New York. And the guy may have just thought, that was crazy. And it was no wonder they said that you could get variations of outcomes from one state to the other um, because of this sort of way in which we carry off elections. And they thought that formalizing this process uh, would have been a great benefit for um, the United States. Well, I, I, I 
think a part of uh, our purpose was to demonstrate to you the importance of having international studies operations in places that we don't know a great deal about what we can learn uh, uh, from them. Uh, in my experience as someone as an undergraduate student who had my first um, exchange um, in an international situation, I went to Africa um, and to Asia, I think I became a much more mature individual, much more interested in uh, being a good citizen and being an active citizen. And I think uh, the importance of the uh, study abroad opportunities um, that we have attached to the MPA program is that it deepens the experience of people who are already deeply engaged as citizens um, in the world of work. And to have this international opportunity in Brazil or um, um, in Ghana simply helps to deepen one's engagement. I think it makes people better at what they do at work um, and so on. Well, there are lots of other things uh, we can talk about in, in reference to political affairs uh, in Ghana. I'd be happy to talk about those. Um, Claudius has tweaked us uh, with these tropical circumstances in Brazil, and we can go on talking about those. Thank you very much. Um, what, one of the secrets of the both countries, but one of the questions I had went to you, but particularly since I was in Asia, the, the African Union, uh, the extension of the uh, trans West, the transcultural highway, I mean, is that will affect the economy in some this very specific and where it stands about these other countries? How do you think it will affect Ghana or the West Coast here? Yeah. Well, assuming that we ever get it built, it will be a tremendous um, advantage in, in linking these economies all along the coast, all of which are members of, not, of, of, of something now called ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. Um, so there is great potential there for a kind of common market. Um, to be much more effective than it is now. Um, and this roadway uh, would link um, a set of highly diverse countries, uh, francophone, anglophone, francophone, uh, actually, along that, that uh, coastline. It would enhance their economic prospects. It would also. Um, enhance the prospects for unity. Uh, one of the greatest problems in the <coughs> day are the borders that countries have to live in that were established by colonial powers. Um, and um, there are ethnic communities um, that flow across borders that make for all kinds of conflictual situations between countries. Just one example, um, the Ivory Coast, for example, uh, when it had its civil war, uh, really on three borders, um, because of the division of people across those borders by colonial powers, uh, was a much broader, larger, more conflictual, messy war than it might have been. Um, so the highway would improve economic circumstances, exchanges um, between them, but would also enhance the probability that some of the cultural patterns, patterns, so-called cultural patterns, uh, that were established by the colonial power can can be broken down and um, um, level out. So it would be uh, tremendous. Um, and the second one, just related to I guess it's the purview of the international commerce and the cooperation across borders in the international year as well. Is our does ECOWAS are they working together to create policies that will regulate this type of inter international exchange? It 
it's mostly economic matters right now. Uh, and uh, increasingly military uh, operations. Um, the first big military operation they had to negotiate was the, uh, uh, the civil war in Liberia, Sierra Leone, because uh, uh, the warlord in Liberia took the war in, into um, Sierra Leone and Guinea as well um, um, on the other side. And um, ECOWAS has a, a military arm now that's called ECOMOG, which was the, the, the armed force um, that went into that conflict and had a, a great role in, in, in resolving it. Soldiers provided intensively by Nigeria uh, and Ghana. Nigeria has got lots of soldiers and lots of everything else. Uh, so it provided more of, of, of the armed uh, force. Uh, so the potential for um, ECOWAS is, uh, is, is really quite great. If you compare it to the European community, for example, which, which, except for a few recalcitrant countries, um, have dropped their individual currencies. Uh, well, every country in, in, in every Anglophone country in the ECOWAS zone has its own currency. Uh, all of the Francophone uh, uh, countries have a unified uh, currency, uh, but it's backed up by the euro. Formerly the, the, the French franc. So the potential of getting a common currency uh, would be an important measure, uh, but it's probably a long way off. Uh, look how long it took Europe to get it 500 years, <laughs> something weird like that. I understand your point. Uh, and it's coming apart. I have a comparative, <laughs> I have a comparative question. Uh, for your two respective countries, could you describe how your neighbors view you in terms of world status, uh, reputation, and let's say uh, your role in your region? Robert, you want to talk about Brazil first? Brazil? Brazil has a. Uh, historical situation in Latin America very funny because it's, it's the only country to speak Portuguese in Latin America. Like uh, the majority of the countries there, Argentina, Uruguay, so many countries, they speak Spanish. And some Guiana, French, um, British, but Guiana too. So as a very major country, big country to speak Portuguese, for a long time, they refuse to be recognized as a Latin American country. They don't see well. They look uh, all the time to Europe and the, the US, trying to emulate them to present themselves as a partner to the, the US. And they recently, so it's, uh, if you talk with people everywhere, uh, most of the time they don't have good idea about the Brazil like in the sense of this partnership. They believe that Brazil don't care very much about Latin America. But Argentina, Argentina at the same time also has this kind of trouble because they say that Argentine people are so proud to be European, they don't care about Latin America. <laughs> they, yeah, Latin America, uh, Italian tradition, Jewish, so many stuff, so they don't care. In recently, because uh, like economic reform is so many, uh, Organization of Economic Community, Brazil uh, entered to the uh, how to say the name of the word? Uh, Mercosur. Mercosur is a uh, Mercosur is a um, South Mer market. Uh, it's it's a joint project with Argentina, 
Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, like uh, about five countries, they have a, a diplomatic, diplomatic relationship and international affair an exchange, an economic exchange. They leave some uh, tax where they can move uh, people and the uh, and the commodities, and also uh, so many business between those borders. And so we said we have like an increasing alliance between those countries. And where Brazil has a major power in that situation because he's one of the leading countries uh, with Argentina, and uh, they have trouble because sometimes they compete. Because they sell in the world market the same products. Like they try to attract they try to, try to Brazil the same investor. So that's a, a very difficult situation. But in the various ends, I think we simply we change the profile of the country. They start to present themselves as a leader in the continental leader. They try to increase the like the participation of each country. They encourage people to go there to work. Uh, we have a, a huge wave of uh, tourists from Argentina, uh, Bolivian are going to Brazil to work in a very slave situation where they, they uh, start to attract people as a, a job opportunity. And uh, so far, I think there is a major change before, because of the, the Mercosur, which was created, I think, they, uh, 15 years ago. Did I answer the question? Uh, yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Ghana is well respected by its neighbors and sometimes envied uh, by them. Um, it goes back um, to um, its independence model. Kwame Nkrumah um, made an argument for a United States of Africa back in 1957 when he came out. Um, all of the leaders, well I wouldn't say all, but the majority of the leaders rejected the idea, rejected that kind of construct. But what Ghana has achieved in unity as a product of the existence of the model makes them uh, an envy in their environment. The country has remained relatively um, unified despite uh, the turbulence and, and coups d'etat and, and, and so on. There has never been a breakdown in Ghana over the question of the acceptability of Ghana as a national entity. And there were strong ethnic groups in Ghana that might have done it. The Ashantis, for example, was a pre-colonial power larger, stronger than present-day Ghana. And they could have broken the country if they had made that choice. They never did. They have often been in opposition, but it has not been in opposition to the very notion of Ghana as a unified entity. And so that stands in the West African region as something uniquely special. Um, countries all around Ghana have fallen apart. Ivory Coast people could never fall apart. It was relatively rich. Uh, it was a little bit like uh, you know, little France overseas. Um, well, that fell apart. Um, Burkina Faso to the north fell apart a long time ago and many times over. Uh, so all around uh, uh, Ghana uh, in, in the region, it is seen as a place to emulate. Um, its relative wealth vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors is another way in which uh, the country um, is uh, respected. Um, it has a, a fairly highly educated um, uh, a population uh, that since 1992 um, has managed governmental affairs uh, uh, very well, uh, and so on. Having said that, I must tell you that uh, still all, 
all of these countries uh, suffer from a brain drain problem. Now, when I tell you that Ghanaians are well educated and Nigerians are well educated, I must also tell you that there are probably more Nigerians, highly educated Nigerians, in text in Houston proper <laughs> than in many cities in Nigeria. There are more Ghanaian physicians in New York City than in the country. Uh, so, but but it is generally fairly well respected. And this is the same too. Yes. Give it to some of your neighbor. And uh, amenable uh, to U.S. citizens. I mean, one of the things we haven't had a chance to talk about is why Ghana is such a special place to have international programs. Kwame Nkrumah, whose idea of a United States of Africa, it must be recalled, was educated in the United States and not Britain, like many of the other Anglophone uh, leaders of other Anglophone countries. He was educated in the United States, had been involved um, in the civil rights movement, saw Harlem, uh, and so on. So this was a guy who knew something about African descendants in the United States, invited many of them back to his country, once it became independent, and there is a huge expatriate population there today. Uh, the Aya Center that uh, Sabir or Michael mentioned um, is an example of what can survive and thrive uh, in the Ghanaian situation. Very welcoming of Americans, long tradition of them coming there, um, um, and so on. So it's, it's on. W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, when he went back uh, to the homeland, uh, found the promise in Ghana. Uh, and and is buried there when there is a, a, a big center, uh, the Du Bois uh, center in the country. So. Well, it, it was Du Bois's model of um, the, uh, Ghana was for Du Bois the realization of the Pan African world that he and the West Indians start to, started to concoct in 1900 and held a series of these congresses uh, uh, throughout uh, Europe and so on. And the arrival of Ghana in 1957 left Du Bois simply ecstatic. And he had to get back uh, to that place. He was an old man by then, but he lived forever and, and he did get back. I'd like to add to that question about Ghana. I just remember it because we have a student there from Howard, which is make a research about the trade between Brazil and the uh, Mozambique. So uh, whenever I think about that, it's important to think about Africa as a hidden market. Because uh, Casey just mentioned the idea to think about the uh, state formation, the relation of border, how people deal, and how you organize the public administration. I think it's very nice, especially when you think about the outcome of this in case of uh, international affairs. Recently, we, we know that Brazil, for some points, has uh, established a huge uh, project to increase their participation, like business participation in Africa. Angola, they have a big supply uh, petroleum uh, industry, also mineral uh, product, like uh, uh, iron, so many stuff like this, and the uh, stuff to organize it. Bomb, atomic bomb, uranium, 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 so many stuff. So today, what we I can see that uh, usually people like major countries like countries like Brazil, also China, and also the West, they understand that Africa is also opportunity for them to profit, to, uh, to expand their their activity, their business, especially.
expression this is of uh, uh, co uh, make corruption, 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 and to get some uh, leader from the inside of the country to be part of them. In this sense, to train them with this kind of uh, uh, Western values, and also to have to have this goal, capitalist goal, is something that is to do with this idea of uh, not, not only train, but also get a uh, brain from that place to take to the like to the metropolis. So that's one point to keep in mind. Whenever we think about these ideas of uh, in, uh, international affair and uh, the study abroad, we need to keep in mind this like what kind of uh, goal and leaders like a, a country like the US has when they start to study all the countries. Business for example, cultural stuff. Even when you match, try to match, like the goal and the value of one country to another, it has to do with not only promote peace and like the friendship between countries, but also to uh, organize a uh, common agenda where they can talk equally and also with the same sense of uh, common project. So I think it's very nice when you keep in mind these uh, points. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're going to cut it off there. It's around 2.30 exactly. I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Martin. And then we say Dr. Clovis, but it's really Dr. Oliveira. We want to say Dr. Clovis. I just made it all right. Yeah, it's hard to switch. Uh, but thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. And hopefully, that this provides an insight to both students and the faculty into the importance of study abroad, the encouragement for students for study abroad, and hopefully, the, the conversation can continue from here. So, thanks.
in fact, I just make a research like I have a, a quick question about the yeah. 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 We so many issues about the problems Well, we need one. Yeah. 